Hello, I'm Matt. And I'm Keith. Welcome to episode 16 of Workshop Banter. It's the hottest day of the year, so how are you finding it? It's fine in the office. I think I'm planning on staying in the office for the next two days. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I've not um, been outside yet, but I've saved up all the editing and computer work for the next two days. I have got, I think, early stages of COVID Mark two though. Oh no. I woke up with a sore throat yesterday. I'm testing negative at the moment, but... Yeah, cases are high at the moment. Yeah, feeling a bit more chilled now as well, because last time we spoke I was mad stressed about having four big projects on the go at once. But I've got one of them completely done now, which was the large gates, which I installed last week. Ooh, video coming up soon on the install. Yeah, I'm going to put a video out this Friday about that. Quite an interesting one as well, because there were some challenges. It's just nice to have that one ticked off the list. I did have a look at your comments because I was having a bad um, comment week and I saw someone said, why don't you just use the domino? That'd be quicker. It's like, yeah. oh, you can't win, can you? Yeah, I responded to that one last night and the, the main reason for not using the domino was because you've only got, I think it's 28 millimetres in depth. Yeah, it's not depth. much. For a, for a gate of that size, I just it's not enough gluing surface. Whereas with this eight millimeter spiral upcut bit, I think I got closer to like forty millimeters. So it's an extra twelve mil or so, and that's a lot of extra gluing surface on both sides of each joint. So it seemed the best way to do it. And, and as much as I didn't enjoy using the router to cut those joints, it was actually easier than I expected it to be. However, it was also very time consuming. It made good content, though. Yeah, hopefully so. A lot of people don't have dominoes, so that was kind of my second reason, showing people that it can be done pretty easily with a router. It just takes a lot of time, because obviously you do the plunge cuts at each end, then you do another pass and another pass and another pass and another yeah. pass, and you have to do that. I don't know, I made three gates, so how many joints is that? Too many joints. It just, it just <laughs> took ages. Well, and it gives you the peace of mind, especially when you're doing it for... A client that mm. you know those gates are going to be strong. I hope so. <laughs> I had that um, Triton Dow joiner, and that was one of the good things about it is you could change the drill bit size. I think they did eight, ten, and twelve, so I didn't bother with the ten. I had the eight for small things and the twelve for big. You could plunge forty mil. Yeah. So I had these twelve by seventy-five mil, so you've got a little bit of room for the glue. So you really could build some big things with a 75 mil long dowel a couple of those in I, I built some doors and my bed frame and it was yeah you could it was good for that I actually had a, a weird email yesterday from a company that they're, they're building their own version of that would I like to try it but it was like at a hotmail email address with no link to the product yeah you got some pictures of this product is it a kickstarter thing or no, like I, no i don't not that they said but i like dow joinery because dows are so cheap but the triton it was okay when it worked but i would just knock it occasionally just by putting it on the bench and the fence would just move by half a degree and then the things wouldn't line up and you just don't want every time you pick a tool up you don't want to get the square out and check every setting on it and so many times that made the glue up very difficult and the joint was wonky and it just, no, I, I'd i had enough in the end. It's such a shame, really, because it's such a great idea for a tool, but it's, from what I've heard, I mean, I've not, I've not used it, but it's just badly executed and, and lacks the refinement that you really would hope it had to do really nice, accurate joinery. People have told me that the newer version is better. I'd heard that too, yeah. Good. It's, it's always nice getting a big job out of the way. Uh, I finished the garden room and as much as I enjoyed making it, it's really nice to get it done. It, it took longer than I thought, actually. So have you done all of the panelling now? Yeah, the inside's all done. The floor went down last week. Some laminate. And uh, I think they've been to Ikea and bought some furniture, so... I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do with the panelling because that's another one of my big jobs that I'm working on at the moment is, is MDF panelling. Oh, really? There's some really interesting ones uh, as like more geometric patterns, which I thought were not really my style, but I thought maybe more you. And I really, really love the, the I love the feature wall idea. I, in fact, 
every house in the room in the house I've painted, I have painted kind of white and then done one wall in a brighter colour. I like that look. So I really like this um, this panelling. And I think I'm definitely going to do it in my workshop because it's not just a workshop for me and you. It's a, a video studio and a photographic studio. So yeah. I think it's having a nice backdrop to take final pictures of things will, mm. be, will be great. Where do you stand on the whole MDF versus pine in terms of um, trim work, like architraves? Well, I've j- just redone my bathroom and... Uh, a bit of skirting came off that was pine, just the, the glue had snapped off. And another bit um, was MDF, and it it swollen. So oh. I think it wasn't MR MDF. So in a bathroom, it's just touching a tiled floor yeah. under a sink. It it's just doesn't work. So I replaced it, and I have gone for pine. Yeah, because I suppose every time you mop that floor or even get out of the shower and have a small puddle of water, that MDF's just going to soak up like a sponge. Yeah, or any kind of leak or drips. It's a small sink, so you're always splashing a bit, I yeah. think. And I've painted every surface of them mm. before installing them as well to seal them up. But yeah, I don't think those pine ones were out-survived me, I'm sure. Well, yeah. they're certainly going to out-survive the bathroom. Mm. So what boards have you got, skirting boards have you got? MDF, I, I would always go MDF, except for a bathroom situation like yours, because ah. obviously you don't want the, the swelling issue. Uh, See, we don't often disagree. <laughs> I've had so many issues with pine skirting boards in the past, in the, with them cupping and twisting, mm. and MDF is just a stable material. And people say, oh, it's just going to damage, it's going to get dinged and scratched and scraped. I used MDF on all of the stuff for the wall for building Ria's office it looks as good as it did the day it went in I mean admittedly we haven't got children running around the place or anything like that but yeah one other thing I would say is obviously with pine you have to not block all of the knots as mm. well shell out that, yeah. that bothers me as well whereas MDF you just slap it on the wall and you're done so are the other big jobs you got top secret at the moment? Uh, not really. Um, one is that I need to build a log store because we're having a log burner installed hopefully next month if things go according to plan. And I've got loads of bits of pressure treated timber either salvaged or left over from other projects. So I'm going to try and take the approach of doing it in a day and spending pretty much no money. So I'm, lo- I'm looking forward to that. That's the kind of build that I want to do after doing a big project, mm. a big complicated project. You just want to kind of knock something out quick and easy that satisfies you. Yeah, when I was at the pub, I after I built a shepherd's hut, I had a pile of treated timber and feather edge and they were keeping the logs in the garage, which was quite far away from the actual pub. So it was every day taking a wheelbarrow load into the pub in the evening in the winter. Mm. So I built them a log store um, out of all my scraps and it took a yeah about three hours yeah this is before youtube and if i said that but then i tried to build one myself that was a log store a bin store and a little shed at my old house to actually replace kind of some fencing and it took about a week i couldn't believe it because <laughs> the last one had taken three hours or something i thought oh this would be a day's job i'm pretty almost bang on normally about knowing how long something would take but I guess the fact that it had spaces for bins and things like that added complication and also because you were filming it. So that's always going to add, I don't know, some people say like 50% yeah. time, but I I don't, you know, I, I think 10 to 20% personally for filming. It depends how much I get into the filming. Mm. Um, the, the EcoFlow video, I really tried to do some more interesting filming and it probably was 50%. But my mum wants something very similar, a log store, and a bin store to go on the side of the house. And there's quite a bit of treated timber and feather edge left over from this project. So that's why I wasn't worried about overordering on anything Mm. because I knew we had these other projects coming up. Really enjoyed your video about the EcoFlow, by the way. And um, I'm assuming, uh, is the longer term plan to hook it up to some solar panels? Well, you saw I've got the solar panels. You've got the kind of um, fold out ones, but are you going to have something more permanent on the roof or something like that? Well, my next video about it, I plan to make a wooden frame for the solar panels to make oh. them rigid. Okay. Um, because there's nothing wrong with it. They're, they're folding panels, which is very fancy, but I, I'm not going to take advantage of the folding bit. Yeah. So it's almost a pain, the fact that they're not rigid. But mm. um, 
I think about a hundred watt panel is about a hundred pounds, and this is a four hundred watt panel. So I'm not going to spend four hundred pounds on panels just to get rigid versions of the ones I've got. I'm just going to mount them to a frame. If I make a frame, I think then I could probably make another frame that kind of just hooks over two sides of the roof, so they're not actually putting. I hate putting screws for a roof. Yeah. If you don't need to, especially exactly, if you put yeah. down a, a rubber thing, the frame will have some serious weight to it. Uh, a lot of people moaned on the video about the price, which is, I think, a fair comment, but I'm happy. And it, it was something I genuinely was looking into spending my own money on. Mm. For my mum's garden room, getting the electrician out was nearly £800, plus over £100 for the armoured cable, which I laid. So if we'd got someone to do it, you'd be well over £1,000 just fitting Absolutely. the electrics. Yeah. Much more complicated in my house. What the neighbours have done is put overhead cables, which are just, they look terrible. Yeah. If a van comes through, it would brush against them, I think. And I'm not sure, because it's a shared road, what the actual legality of it would be. Yeah. So, and I, yeah, I don't want to get into that. Anyway, I'm very happy with the system. Yeah. And it's two things that have happened this year, I guess, that I had never planned was the tent and this. Mm. I, I was planning to still be in my living room and it's just, I was thinking about this morning, I can't imagine still working in my living room now. I just, it, it would have really affected the projects. I would not have been chopping down huge bits of treated timber in mm. my living room. But in the tent is fantastic. So I've got a rant this week. Oh. If I can take over your ranting duties. Go on then. <laughs> I went to my local sawmill uh, a couple of weeks ago to pick up an embarrassingly small amount of wood. Um, I, I just needed three capping rails for the top of these gates and some feather-edged boards for a fence that um, just needed finishing off for my auntie because a tradesman had left it unfinished for some reason. And I said, well, as I'm coming over, I might as well just pick up some feather-edged boards and finish it off for you. So that's what I did. It was like um, eight pieces of feather edge, three capping rails or something like that. It's just the process of buying timber that just frustrates me so much. <laughs> because the first thing you do is you order it online on the website. You put in what you want. You send the order off. You put in a collection time the next day. You drive over there. You go into the office. You queue up. There's only one lady in there behind the till. And she's on the phone. So I'm like behind a couple of people waiting ages. She's on the phone for a long time. Not, not having a go at her, you know. She's just doing her job. That's fine. You eventually get to the till. You say, oh yeah, I've ordered some timber online. Give them the order reference. Okay, go outside and see the forklift driver. Then there's a queue for the forklift driver because obviously there's a row of cars and there's no kind of way of saying, well, I was here first kind of thing. So it's kind of like whoever, whoever's the biggest bloke who's kind of like looking. A bit similar to when, when you're trying to get a drink at the bar. Mm. You have to kind of assert yourself a bit sometimes <laughs> to, to get yourself noticed. So then you're queuing up again and waiting. Um, the forklift driver comes. You give him your ticket, he goes away, gets it, comes back, you put it into your car. And you, you just think this process could be streamlined. It could be so much better if I place the order online, send the ticket to the forklift driver who's got an iPad or something with the orders. But yeah, the, the whole thing, it's, the timber industry is just so, hasn't moved forward, has it really? No. So do they actually have your order ready? Have they picked it all and got it in a pile? No. So what's the point of ordering online? Exactly. <laughs> it's just the fact that, you, you know, you, you order it online, you queue up for the office, then you queue up for the forklift driver, and then you eventually get your timber. And by the way, the, the timber order was wrong. And I, I only noticed it when I got home. that I didn't have enough feather edge boards. So I dropped them an email and just said, I took a photo of the boards and I said, I've just, you know, picked up, I think it was seven feather edge boards. And she's like, oh, is it, is it possible to pop back? And it's like, oh, man, I've just wasted over an hour picking it up. Yeah. I don't want to waste another hour going back for one board that I might not even need because, by the way, I was just guessing the amount of boards I might need to finish this fence. So I said, well, no, not really. I'm not going to waste an hour for one feather edge board, which is like pound fifty or something. It's just, <laughs> I just said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just um, hope that I've got enough boards here to do the job. And then... To be fair to them, she wrote back and said, oh, don't worry, we, we've got a delivery going out later today. If you're at home, we can drop one off. So they, mm. they actually dropped one off at my door, which was, you know, pretty good service, really. But it's just the whole process is just frustrating. It's just no automation. Yeah, that sounds crazy. I, I, when I when you said order online, I thought it'd be like one of the supermarkets, how you order online, then they have a 
click and collect section where they have the orders ready and mm. you drive up to that section and your order's there and they put it in the car. Why would you not speed everything up for everyone, wouldn't yeah. it? That would be awesome. So during the garden room, there's a timber yard up the road that just does treated timber. Fencing, basically. Yeah. But their website's bad. The neighbour's fencing was... One of the posts was broken in the middle, so the fence was swaying. But everything else was fine. And I was like, oh, if we just go and get a four metre long 4 by 2 and screw it to the good posts, but it would just brace it. Yeah. And I looked online, like, oh, they don't list, they do any kind of um, two-by material. But you go in the office, and like, oh, do you have any 4.8 metre long uh, four by twos? And like, oh, yeah, they're 15 quid. Like, why would you not have that on your, <laughs> you have a price list on your website, but not for all the products you sell. Mm. But they are quite good. You go in the office, and then they tell you to drive into the yard to where the thing is, and then they come and help you put it in the car. And they're very friendly. Uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. And it, and it kind of makes sense, almost. It's worth paying more for the materials from somewhere else because they offer delivery, isn't it? Because if you're in the trade and suddenly that's an hour of your time and you're on 250, 300 pounds a day, what's your, what's your hourly rate? Yeah. It's... It's suddenly worth spending an extra 10, 20 quid to this not spend that time. I mean, I'm in the luxury position of kind of doing YouTube for a living. If I was in the trade trying to, you know, finish off a fence for a customer and every time I popped to this timber merchant, it took me, you know, an hour to come out with the wood I needed. That would be really frustrating because I'd be thinking, you know, I want to crack on. I want to get this job done and I want to get home. I you have to say this local yard... They know the people, like the fencers, and this fencing guy in the village, they gave him a key to the yard when they were closed for COVID. He was just allowed to go in, pick up anything he wanted, <laughs> write it down, and they just settle it up when they reopened no so way. he could keep working. It's good, that kind of stuff, but then it's also sometimes frustrating, a bit like a pub, when you go in a pub and it's just full of locals and everyone looks at you, and sometimes timber merchants can be a bit like that because it's the same people every day yeah placing thousands of pounds orders and then they have this DIYer coming in wanting to spend 25 quid they just yeah. don't want to deal with you yeah An- another interesting thing actually when i was in- doing the gate project was um because i had to install this additional post i was kind of looking on my phone at what was around my auntie's house because i was there where I could buy a 4x4 post and literally just down the road was a B&Q so I went to B&Q picked up a 4x4 post there £34 for a 2.4 metre 4x4 post which Mm. I was amazed at once I bought it I kind of like just had a sneaky look at my phone to see how much my local fencing kind of timber merchant place you know would charge for the same amount of wood I'm looking at it now 2.4 metre length 100 by 100 post £11.16. pence. Wow. So it's literally three times the price at B&Q. Yeah. Sometimes, well, a bit like where my mum is, the nearest B&Q is a 40-minute drive away. Mm. If the timber yard's closed and things, what are you going to do? Not do the work or go and get it? Yeah. yeah. And at fuel prices at the moment, you want to use something local. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to do a Wix uh, order this week. It's not the cheapest, but... They do free delivery. I think it used to be 75. I think they've changed it to something weird, like £87. But it's pretty yeah. easy to spend £87. Yeah, I've used that a lot too. The, the only thing I struggle with, I don't know whether this is a problem nationally or whether it's just locally to me, but a lot of the time I will go on there and there just won't be any delivery slots available. Oh, it's fine here. I could get is one it? tomorrow. Yeah, see, I, I struggle probably more times than not, actually, I would say. Probably mm. seven times out of ten, there's no oh. delivery slots each time. Yeah, I think the trouble is we're so used to things like Amazon where yeah. you can get same-day delivery and you can track on the app and see, oh, your driver's eight stops away, seven stops away. You can, you, And then you try and use anyone else and it just doesn't live up to that standard. So maybe this is a good rant. It's a problem from another perspective as well because... Um, I don't really want to be ordering from a company like Amazon. In no. a similar way as I don't really want to be ordering from Weatherspoons. I don't want to be drinking in Weatherspoons, but the thought of going in, sitting at a table, ordering from my phone and getting my drinks delivered to my table 
without all of that hassle of being at the bar going, well, I'm next kind of thing. You know, more often than not, if somebody suggests going to Weatherspoons, I'm like, yeah, go on then. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was kind of a wanted to boycott Weatherspoons, and but you just can't. <laughs> It's so frustrating. So when you were at the pub, were you a chef? Was that where you were making food? So the pub where I was YouTubing was my mum's business and I was doing some chefing. But before that, I ran my own pub in Hertfordshire. Right. But nothing food related when you ran your own pub? Oh, yeah. I was the chef. You were the chef as well? Sorry. I was the chef as well. Do you miss chefing at all? I guess you still do quite a lot of cooking now. You're kind of at home. I, I still love cooking. The idea of it's going to be a 40 degree day, which means in a kitchen, it would just be horrendous. That must be the worst job in the world to have on a day like this. Yeah. And I bet they're busy because people want to be going out. Mm. Horrendously hot. You may start at nine in the morning. You're still in the kitchen at 10 at night. And if you've been busy, it, I can't think of another job where you're busy. So, oh, just don't have a break. Just mm. work that insane long hours in heat and don't eat anything because we're busy. Mm. I mean, that doesn't sound legal, but that's what you would do. And, you and just I bet that's when it. you start making mistakes as well. If oh. you haven't eaten and you're just, you know, constantly making, making, making food. And it's a vicious circle because then there's a huge amount of drug use in the chef trade. And you can imagine why people at 10 mm. o'clock at night are just dead on their feet but they've had no social life, so they want to do something after work. So they take something and then go out. And then there's yeah. a lot of alcoholism as well, because what can you do at 10 at night? There's only one thing you can really do, and that's drink. That's not yeah. true at all, but that's that's what people do. Because you need to unwind, because you can't just... You're shattered, but you can't go to sleep a straight yeah. after a shift. You're buzzing. So then you don't go to sleep until the early hours of the morning, and then you're up again at pretty much kind of the time everyone else goes to work. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it's just horrible. Horrible, horrible. Made me stress just thinking about it. And you're getting paid sod all as well. <laughs> what kind of food would you say you enjoyed cooking then? I, I, I liked working in country pubs and doing kind of those kind of... Sort of pub grub kind of Yeah, food. nice home-cooked pub grub. I like yeah. the kind of comfort foody things. Nice. Like one of my favourite things to make is... I love pizza and I like making my own dough and doing that. So nothing fancy really I, I do do fancy things occasionally it's nice to play but it, I don't like I've been to quite a few mission star restaurants and what I can't stand is fussy service where people waiting staff they don't let you pour your own wine or water they don't even they don't even trust you to have it on the table mm. they have to keep it over and they bring it to you just just leave us alone <laughs> <laughs> and they put a napkin on your lap for you and stuff yeah like that oh something. it makes me feel really uncomfortable yeah same here so I like going to gastro pubs where you can have excellent food, but it's just more friendly. You can chat to the staff rather than they're not allowed to talk to you and it's just mm. they're there to serve you. I find that very awkward. Yeah. I've got some techniques to keep cool in the workshop because uh, these are things I did as a chef. I always keep water bottles in the fridge, like reusable ones. And I was in Tesco's the other day and they do these ice cube trays that are designed for water bottles. They look like Cabris fingers. Right. So you've got these like ice shards, Cabris finger ice shards that you can drop in the neck of a water bottle. Okay. So I've got a pile of them in the freezer. With the garden room, I was trying to be safe. I, I, you're pretty pale like me as well. <laughs> do you um, suntan lotion up when you're doing the gates and things? Um, I didn't when I did the gates. I got really sunburnt. <laughs> It's one of those jobs where you prepare for every eventuality in terms of the tools you might need, but you yeah. forget about protecting yourself. So, mm. for example, I didn't bring any safety glasses. I brought ear defenders because I just wear ear defenders all the time. Um, didn't bring sun lotion. Didn't even bring a bottle of uh, water, oh, which was no. madness. Luckily, it was my auntie, so she just, you know, she kept me fed and watered. But so. that's something I really need to get better at. Whenever I do a job out, it's it's always, you know, what tools do I need? What fixings might I need? Not what do I actually need to keep myself going? <laughs> yeah, I was quite organised, actually, with the gun room. I bought, you know, the little protein bars you get, um, the kind of like almost like breakfast cereal bars. I bought a pile mm. of them because sometimes you're working and suddenly you go, I'm starving. Yeah. And I even packed a little first aid 
kit, some plasters, and I've got these little plastic vessels that are eye wash because I bet as a woodworker you've got bits in your eyes mm. a few times. I've only happened a couple of times, but when you do it, you really want to be able Flush to sort it out. it out. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I did that, but yeah, I hate putting suntan lotion on. You just feel greasy, but yeah. it's been so hot. And I had a baseball cap, but what I've also got is like this sun hat with a wide brim that has a curtain over the back to go down your neck. Yeah. And I've been wearing that this week while I've been doing some painting outside. I don't know. These are not really tips, are they? Put them on suntan lotion in the sun, <laughs> wear a hat and put water in the fridge. But it's so easy to forget these things. Mm. The door went this morning. I wasn't dressed. Uh, I've been up for a while, but because it's so hot, this is a visual image for people. I've been walking around in my pants with the <laughs> curtains closed. And then the doorbell goes at like 8.30. Like, oh no, what's that? I'm quickly pulling on some trousers. And it's the new um, Isotunes I got yeah. with the microphone. So I'm looking forward to testing those. Because I know you weren't a huge fan, but I really like the old ones. So Good, yeah. I'll try not to wear the mic on film because people <laughs> will lose their minds if I'm trying to look like Britney Spears. Oh man, you mentioned um, mean comments, but I've had so many this week on a on a Facebook video I did about Render and Pebble Dash, but 90% of them are all about, why is this guy wearing earmuffs? And you look at all of these people that are commenting really nasty things about the work that I did, and they're all professional plasterers and renderers. It's like, hey, why are you watching a video of a DIYer rendering and pebble dashing? You're, you're only watching it so that you can criticise. And B... How have you not heard of Bluetooth? How do you not know that Bluetooth exists? How do you not know that people wear ear defenders and play music through them? It does amaze me that the comment, oh, he's wearing ear defenders when he's not doing something loud. Then it's just, I won't think about this for a second longer. I'm just going to comment, not thinking, well, he's probably just left them on because he's just walked away from something loud and not going to take anything off. Or yeah. maybe they're Bluetooth ones. Just, yeah, it's just... <laughs> I know, I'm just going to shout my opinion. <laughs> yeah. This video is sponsored by Polyvine, who have an excellent range of varnishes, decorative paints, oils, wood care products and adhesives, which are made here in the UK. Yeah, and we're both really looking forward to trying out their products in future projects. I'm particularly interested in the heavy-duty water-based varnish, which is a product that I tend to use quite a lot in my projects. And it's always nice to be able to promote a UK-based business. For more information, I'll leave a link to their website and socials in the description box below. Please do check them out. Do you fancy going through some of the comments we've had recently? Because we've got some good ones, I think. Oh, yeah, good. Positive, um, I hope. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, unpopular opinion, and I'm going to make myself really unpopular here because I think you might both have done this, but unbiased reviews, no such thing, unless you paid for it with your own money. To my knowledge, almost no one gets paid cash for positive reviews or are told they can only have something if they leave a positive review. But it's well established that we're likely to feel favourable towards someone if they give us stuff for free. It hasn't cost you anything, so even if it's rubbish, you're probably better off having it than not, right? So when content creators say, a company sent me this, but I'm going to give my unbiased opinion from a psychological point of view, it's BS. You got it for free, so you're biased. I know sometimes people will give a mediocre review and think they're all impartial, but in general, companies know how this bias works. That's why they send people stuff. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I brought up the example before of Evolution, how they flooded YouTube with giving very small YouTubers, like someone with 50 subscribers, a free saw, and then they put a review up. Mm. People just thrilled. Maybe it's their first mighty saw. It's a very clever marketing strategy, but... Yeah. It means YouTube is full of excellent reviews of the Evolution Saw. And I've had three of them, I think. And I've kind of hated them all. Um, we've kind of seen a similar thing with Trend recently as well, haven't we? With them, um, the amount of tools that they've sent out. I would kind of go one step further than what he said and say that even if you've paid your own money for the tool... You're still not unbiased. <laughs> I was going to still... say exactly the same thing. Because you can be biased over anything. I mean, even if it's the colour of the tool, that might sway you towards that tool. Or, you know, if a if a brand has a certain reputation, we talked about Weatherspoons earlier, you know, I don't want to buy stuff from Weatherspoons. 
So I'm biased about where I drink. There is no such thing as unbiased. No. I think um, also if you spent your own money on something, you're quite likely to say it's good because you've made the decision and the investment and you don't want to admit that it's been a bad decision and an investment. Mm. Uh, unless something's really terrible and you're angry about that. So yeah. it's, it's interesting psychology, but it depends what you want from the video. If you're going, I'm only going to buy this product if Keith says it's great, then yeah, it's a problem. But mm. if you're doing a video going, this is a product, this is what it can do, then you're just demonstrating and people can make up their own minds. And that's how I watch all reviews. Yeah, um, I want to see the features it has, maybe a comparison to something else, and just seeing it in a real life setting, maybe. Yeah. I even watch, um, in fact, I was looking at some studio lights this morning. I've been watching the company's own YouTube video. Obviously, they're going to say it's amazing and it's going to solve all the problems I have. Yeah. But it's still a useful video just seeing the product in action. Yeah. So it depends what you're taking away from it. I would never take somebody's opinion online, regardless of whether they paid for the tool or not, as my exclusive research for that particular product. But maybe I get I get a bit obsessive when I have to part with money. <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of research <laughs> as well. But I think their their point is correct. Yeah. There is no such thing as I buy reviews, but you approach everything knowing that. Yeah. So I don't think it makes um, reviews unhelpful. Otherwise, by that logic, there's really no point in any review. Yeah. And I get a lot of use out of reviews. I guess what bothers me about that is that people might think if it's in some kind of web article with a big name attached to it, like fine woodworking or something like that, there is no way that an official magazine article or whatever it might be is any less unbiased than any YouTuber out there creating content, in my opinion. People think there's an air of authority with yeah. magazines or television. You know, none of these things are unbiased. Yeah, I've not bought a woodworking magazine for years, but I've read reviews and they feel like, what's it when it's a paid article? Advertorial? Uh, yeah, that could be it. And normally they put that, but some of the reviews are like, this is really a glowing review. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't believe it. But still, telling you the specs and the size and the price is still all useful information. Mm. The internet has become a bit of a cesspit for reviews as well in terms of if you try to research any product, you're going to find predominantly articles that are just full of affiliate links and no real information. <laughs> Oh, yes. Something that we both do is try and put as much value for the viewer into the review as possible by telling people the things that we like and dislike about them and the features. Whereas a lot of this stuff on the internet is just, um, it's designed to make money. Yeah. And I'm not going to stop doing it. And this might, people will be angry about this and say I'm a sellout. But Axminster gave me a discount on that bandsaw. I would not have been able to afford it mm. without it. And... I've spent years building up this business of a YouTube channel. If that is something I'm going to get back for doing it, then I'm yeah. going to take it. And I think anyone else in the same position would do exactly the same. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if the saw had been terrible, I would have said that and sent it back. And I'm in a strange position at the moment, as in I got rid of all my tools because of personal reasons, really, with moving, which I have covered in a video. But it just mean that this year I'm replacing a full workshop of tools. So there is going to be a lot of me mm. getting new tools. And that's just... Circumstances. Yeah, it's just circumstances. Yeah. This deal with Bosch, they haven't sent me £2,000 worth of tools out of goodness of their heart. Mm. They want me to produce videos about them. And that's a contract I have, and I'm going to do it. But it's £2,000 worth of tools, and I do not have £2,000 to spend on tools. Every mm. penny I had went on the, the house. Yeah. And without the tools, I can't make videos. But also, I think there's a strong element of trust involved as well. So if I was looking for a product review of a particular product, say I searched YouTube for it, and I saw a content creator that I've been watching for years and whose opinions and values I trust, then that's the video that I'm going to click on because I'm going to want to know what that person thinks of the tool. You have to make, use your own judgment, don't you, in, in terms of who you trust the recommendations of. And I think me and you are probably quite picky on who we work with, as in 
this year I've been contacted by, well, you did a video about tool brands, these kind of Amazon tool, power tool sellers that you've never heard of. Mm. Would you like to try a range of our power tools for free? And I, no, I wouldn't. And JCB, I think, did the rounds contacting. Mm. Trend obviously did. And they were useful to you at the time because you didn't have any tools either. Yeah. But they When they wrote to me, it was like, well, I've, I've got all of those tools. What's in it for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was a, a long answer to that. But yeah, I think they have a point. It's just the way the world works. Mm. So this is from Goran at Nomad Makes. And this was in reference to my Gates video. And he asks, um, when you say that using salvage materials made for a substantial saving, I guess you haven't factored in your time spent salvaging, preparing the materials. If you were to pay yourself a decent hourly rate, would it still be a substantial saving? I find that kind of hard to believe, even with timber prices as they are now. Of course, some types of materials are easier to salvage than others. And don't get me wrong, I am all for the environmental aspect of using salvage materials. So that was a, I think that's a really interesting one. And that's that is of, a really good question. That's probably a decision that we have to tackle on a regular basis. Uh, you know, is this worth my time? And and for me, taking pallets apart and things like that tends not to be worth my time. But larger scale kind of salvaging, I don't know. What are your thoughts? It's understanding who we are. We're not tradespeople who mm. have taken on a job and are trying to earn money on it. We're YouTubers. You particularly have an interest in using salvage materials for costs, but also environmental reasons, I imagine, and just reducing waste. So if you were Keith Brown fence installer, it makes no sense whatsoever. If you're a Keith Brown YouTuber who's known for reclaimed materials, then absolutely makes sense. Although interestingly, I've had a look at the cost side of things, and I think it was still worthwhile. And obviously you have to take everything on a case-by-case -case basis. But even if I was Keith Brown, fence installer, tradesperson, I still would have done it in this instance. Because if I think about purely the additional tasks to process those decking boards into the gate, you could say that collecting the doors... Oh, by the way, these decking boards came from doors, I should say. Mm -hmm. So collecting the doors was one. However, I was going to be surveying that job anyway. I needed to go there to measure up. So I'm not going to add any time for that. Taking the doors apart was surprisingly time consuming because of the amount of screws in them and the silicon in between each board. That probably took an hour, possibly hour and a half. Ripping the edges of each board and cutting the ends, probably half an hour. Filling the holes left by the screws and sanding, maybe 45 minutes. So that's probably about half a day's work. Um, for a saving of, of about 140 to 150 pounds. So based on my day rate, without telling everyone what my day rate is, well, actually, I think my patrons probably already know what my day rate is because I've done a few sort of cost breakdown articles. That's worth my time, regardless of whether I'm a YouTuber trying to inspire people to make use of salvage materials or a tradesman, that's still worth my time but that was a client job so you'd have passed the costs on anyway but it's interesting because i've never heard of a person that does custom gates as a tradie mm. that only uses reclaimed materials yeah that would be an interesting business wouldn't it because i wonder how many clients would be happy paying that kind of money to use reclaimed materials i imagine in in london or something you could really sell that yeah but maybe they don't look as nice sometimes. I don't want to you know, say your gates no, are nice. No, absolutely. But... I've had, that's a really good point because I've had situations on my Etsy page before where I've listed products and I've sold products. And in the description I've put, please be aware this item is made from reclaimed materials. There may be character or imperfection in the boards, etc. But I've had, a, I think I've only had one occasion to be fair, but somebody wrote to me and wasn't happy I can't remember what it was. So yeah, that is a factor. Mm. And I guess the worry also is, especially with outdoor things, that timber outdoors only has a certain lifespan. So mm. reusing timber that's already been outdoors, maybe the gates won't last as long as brand new. I'm not saying that is true because the time you've put finish on and things and it, it's all fine. But yeah, it's um, a harder 
sell. But yeah, totally. it'd be an interesting yeah. business if if anyone knows of anyone that's uh, doing kind of uh, commercial timber work that is all from reclaimed materials. That is interesting because I've not heard of anyone doing that. Yeah. But I think if you're doing it for yourself, I class my time as worthless. <laughs> as in, and I, I think most DIYs do the same. If you're mowing your lawn on a Sunday, mm. you don't go, well, that's cost me 20 pounds in labour to do it, do mm. you? You just, yeah. it's what else am I going to do? I've probably just been sat watching the TV. I will do the job myself. Yeah. So doing jobs myself, I don't count my time, uh, but I know I'm saving money. Yeah. Because I'm not taking time off work to do it. I'm taking my leisure time to do mm. the work and that's saving me money. Yeah. This is from a chap called Chris who says, unpopular opinion, biscuit jointers are a waste. Is it biscuit joiners or biscuit jointers? I, I always get that wrong. I don't know. I bet <laughs> if you if you type it into Google, it will come up with the same thing. I bet people different list them and did both. Probably. That's a terrible sentence. <laughs> Let's go with biscuit joiners. Anyway, yeah. unpopular opinion, biscuit joiners are a waste of time, space, plastic and metal. Having owned a few, I literally don't see the point in them. I know they help with alignment, but there's that much play in the joints. They don't hold anything in place to make handling the cabinet or tabletop any easier. I had one and it's I, I sold it when I moved along with everything else. I'm not going to replace it. Yeah, he's right for alignment on glue up, especially on thinner boards. I think is is helpful, mm. but is it necessary? Clamping some are they called calls when you clamp yeah, clamping calls? Yeah, calls. Yeah, they seem to work. It's an extra step, but then so is doing biscuits. And um, I follow Carpenter One Three on Instagram. He does great little videos, and you can get dips with biscuit joiners, as in the. The, if you have it too close to the surface, the wood yeah. will shrink down. There's, there's potential problems. Mm. I used Peter's jig to build this cabinet the other week, and like they genuinely add strength of domino, as a biscuit mm. is just alignment. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm on. I'm on the fence. I don't think there's something I want, but if other people like them, then they're not wrong. Other people don't like them, they're not wrong for not liking them. Mm. There you go. I don't have an opinion. It's funny how much we agree because I am also on the fence with this one because I've never had a good quality biscuit joiner. I've only had a Draper one, which I think I paid £25 for second hand. And I hated it. I absolutely hated it. But I've seen people use, you know, better quality DeWalt ones or whatever to good effect. And people seem to really like them. I would definitely say they're not the most useful tool. I, I certainly don't feel like I need a biscuit joiner, especially if, you know, if you've got a domino, then you certainly don't need a biscuit joiner in the workshop. But then you're a big fan of Gid Joiner. Mm. And he uses, uses biscuits, yeah. yeah. If I didn't have a domino, I still wouldn't buy a biscuit joiner, personally. I just don't feel like it's something that I need. I would be more inclined to cut a groove in the edge of a board on the table saw, a 5 mil groove or a, even a 3 mil curf groove. And then just cut a spline to go in or something like that. I don't know. I just don't feel like I need a biscuit joiner. I don't want a biscuit joiner. I don't really like the biscuit joiner. But for those they work well for, great. The, the good thing about um, biscuits and dominoes is that little bit of play you get to be able to yeah. align things. As there's no play in dowels, which is why your dowel joiner has to be precise. Otherwise you're in a world of trouble. Yeah, and I guess that the other thing biscuit joiners have got going for them is the speed and convenience of using them. They are yeah. really quick and easy to use. One thing I never tried was the attaching table tops with the biscuit joiner. So in your table frame, using the biscuit joiner to put slots in. And I then think put I've those... tried that actually once yeah. before. Yeah. It seemed a good idea. Mm. But again, I'm not going to buy a biscuit joiner just for that one feature. So we've done nothing for biscuit joiner sales. <laughs> Is that an unbiased review, though? <laughs> we are actively looking for sponsors, so if there are any um, biscuit joiner companies out there that yeah, want I love to biscuits. Sponsor us, we love biscuit gonna... joiners. Yeah. Best tools. <laughs> God, such a sellout. <laughs> Show me the money. Shall we move on to recommendations? Go on then. I've got a really good one this week. Only one. Well, 
This one came as a recommendation from one of our listeners called Ben Clark. Um, he suggested we checked out a video by Bo Miles, who isn't a woodworker as such. He has done woodworking on his channel, but the video he recommended is called Saving This House's Wood From Landfill. And it's a mass salvaging operation prior to the professional demolition people yeah. coming in with their big vehicles. I don't know if you've seen it. No, I'm just writing it down. It is fantastic. It's such a good video. I've kind of been binge watching all of his other videos since this one as well. He does some woodworking projects where he makes some furniture for an office um, using salvaged desks. He has done one where he built a cabin in the woods for for his other half as an office space for her to use. And, you know, his woodworking skills aren't up there with the best. I think he'd probably admit that himself. But what, what he lacks in joinery skills, he more than makes up for in just inspirational ways of living. Cinematography and filmmaking is just incredible. I think he is a professional filmmaker, actually. He's not the Australian guy. Australian, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. You know, know him already. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I think the first one was Walk the Line, where he walks this abandoned railway line. Yeah, he's just an amazing... Yeah. He's a university lecturer. He walked to work one day, which is like 50 mile or 50 kilometre walk. Really? Just, yeah, he's great videos. Uh, canoeing and, yeah, he stayed awake for 24 hours and he tried to do a job every hour for 24 hours yeah his videos are amazing one of the ones i watched yesterday was when he he ate beans for he yes. ate nothing but beans for oh. 40 days i thought they were going to be <laughs> baked beans like oh i wonder if i could do that i like baked beans but just tins of beans in water and he removed all of the labels from each tin of beans so that he didn't know which type of beans he oh. was going to be unlocking for that meal and seeing his disappointment when he opened a can of, I think it was black beans or something. But yeah, just fantastic videos. That's a, that's a good recommendation. So I've got one. Uh, DIY board and batten accent wall, which is by Fix This, Build That. So a big channel, but he does very slick content. Then YouTube is um, recommending off that DIY Huntress's one which is good as well but it's a pretty simple technique but you can go down um rabbit holes of more interesting patterns but i like the for what i wanted i would like the traditional one the other recommendation i had giving my neighbor's tree a new life by Matt Cremona. it's a really long video it's like over an hour long i think it's like an hour and 20 minutes long but the the cabinet that he made oh is it a whiskey cabinet yeah yeah oh my the god live edge kind of door i mean i know neither of us are particularly into epoxy projects but i think this is a good example of using epoxy in, in what i consider to be a really good way because it's been used to make up a panel effectively and and fill a void in timber rather than you know as a as a feature but it um yeah that, the work he did on that was just incredible i also love how much of a hybrid woodworker he is as well so he cut all of his dovetails on the bandsaw on the table saw and yet they looked immaculate often if there's a video over an hour long i won't even click on it because I, I haven't got that kind of time but there's certain creators like matt that i'll think you know i'll wait for a nice afternoon when i've got access to the rope control and i'll sit and enjoy watching that with a with a beer or a cider i'd seen the pictures but i hadn't watched it yet but i will do that this evening he's an incredibly impressive guy mm. as in he builds something beautiful like that look proper fine woodworking and some of these bits are they look like museum quality pieces yeah and then he does these massive engineering projects like the bandsaw. Yeah. And then just this kind of side business cutting slabs. I mean, he's just... And, and, and he's doing rebuilding his house at the same time. Yeah, and he's also churning out the videos. In, yeah. You know, probably one or two a week. Like, how, how are you doing that? <laughs> I like him because he's prepared some... I don't want to insult people, but some kind of fine woodworkers won't do DIY yeah. And like, no, they only make nice things. As Matt will get his hands stuck in, he's helping his builder plaster walls and things. Yeah. And I, I like that he just gets his hands stuck in on anything, give anything a go. He's clearly a very 
capable, clever man. Yeah. Thank you for listening. You can find Keith on YouTube by searching for Rag N Bone Brown and me by searching for Badger Workshop. We have a Patreon page if you'd like to help support us in making future episodes of the podcast. Link to that in the show notes. And we have a Workshop Banter Instagram and Facebook page if you'd like to get in touch, which is at Workshop Banter, all one word. <laughs>